Guys, have you ever heard tennis fans saying, Oh, it's a weak era. It's a fake slam. The drop is rigged. He was injured. Of course you have. You happen to be a tennis fan. You most likely use those arguments somewhere, sometime already in your life. But today I'm not here to use those lame arguments. I'm here to use my brain. I'm going to trigger you in a civilized fashion, in a logical way. Now the way I'm going to do it is quite simple. I'm going to pick two logical arguments when it comes to each and every single member of the big three. I'm going to present to you in a logical way and that's going to trigger you because the truth does hurt at the end of the day. Now the fairest way, is that the word? The most fair way to do it in my opinion is to start with Novak Djokovic because I happen to be on the right side of history. I happen to be a Novak Djokovic tennis fan. I'm just joking but I do think that it's the most fair way to do it. I am a Novak Djokovic tennis fan after all. So let's just start off with triggering myself I guess. So how do I exactly trigger myself? Oh wait, I know, the 40-15 thing. Listen guys, the 40-15 thing, the most beautiful thing in the world. If you're a Novak fan, you'll understand. If you're not, you are really missing out on a lot of things. Listen guys, the 40-15 thing, the great equalizer. It's not even the great equalizer, it's like the great debate ender, the GOAT debate ender. You just, I mean, you're if you're arguing on the internet, you're just going to post that picture of that woman from the 2019 Wimbledon final with her finger up in the air, and you just won the debate. Like, it's over. It's It's done. But listen, guys, I have to admit something. Um, that was lucky. Like, that was a lucky escape. The 2019 Wimbledon final, the 2011 US Open semifinal, and to a certain extent, the 2010 US Open semifinal too. It was lucky because at the end of the day, Novak Djokovic is the king of the Houdini stuff, of the escaping from the jaws of defeat, of the comebacks, of everything. But his rope-a-dope when it comes to the comebacks was really, really short versus Roger Federer in a couple of occasions. And at the end of the day, Roger Federer could have served an ace or two. He could have. He really could have. And if you don't think that's true... The same thing happened at the 2011 French Open semifinal. Roger Federer did serve an ace. It was 6-5 in the tiebreak. And if he wouldn't have served an ace there, all hell would have break and lose. And I think Novak wins that match in five sets. And he plays Nadal. Imagine that match. 2011 Nadal versus 2011 Djokovic at the French Open final. After Djokovic beating Nadal, I think, twice already that season on clay. That would be... I mean, that would have been an epic match. But congrats to Federer. That was a great Federer match, by the way. But nevertheless... Yeah, it was it was lucky. It was lucky. Listen, guys, you can watch the points. You can say that Novak did everything well, which he did. But at the end of the day, Federer made a couple of really weak shots, weak errors. And I'm actually going to break him down point by point. Let's start off with the 2011 US Open semifinal. Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic, two sets all. High drama situation. Pressure, 5-3 to three in the fifth. Up 40-15 on his serve, trying to close it out. Let's see what Roger Federer does. Well, he serves a really poor first serve. I'm not sure if I've ever seen Roger Federer having that poor of a placement on his first serve. That Like, that was actually... That was so bad that I'm not even sure if he's trying to go wide or if he's trying to go into Novak's body. He hits really poorly, lands on Novak's forehand, return perfectly, he rips the forehand, it's 40-30. Now, the next point, he hits a really good body serve, but Novak actually manages to get off a decent return, and then Federer just misses a forehand. Why? I mean, it's a forehand, it's not a difficult shot. Now it's choose. Um, next point, Federer misses another forehand, this time wide. What is going on? And then he hits an ace, which is really good. And then, uh, they play a contested point in which Federer misses, like, a 6 out of 10 difficult forehand. He nets it. I mean, he should be able to put that forehand into play. And then he double folds. Federer? Really? What's going on here? Okay, so let's do the 2019 Wimbledon final. It's 8-7 to seven in the 5th set. Federer is trying to serve it out. He has a break. It's 40-15 again. The first match point is a second serve. Djokovic hits a good-ish return, but it's nothing too deep. Like, it doesn't really land on the baseline. It's probably like a meter past the serve line, actually. And Federer is just kind of lazy to the ball. He's late, and he misses a kind of mid-difficult forehand. 40-30, he hits a okay T-line serve. It's a block return. 
And then the approach shot is nothing special. I think Federer should have gone cross court here, but uh, the, the shot is just not good. It's just not there. It lands on Novak's forehand and he still has to execute. It's a beautiful passing shot. It's one of the greatest moments in, it's actually one of the coldest moments in tennis history. It's just so cold. But then again, Federer should have done more in this point. Now at 40-40, we kind of play a semi-contested point, but all it is is basically a backhand cross-court rally. It's not even a rally, it's like five shots. And Federer does the classic shanker backhand. This time the ball actually lands in play, but it's way too short on Novak's forehand who attacks it and Federer cannot put it back in play. And then the break point... It's, again, a block return for Novak on Federer's first serve. And then Federer, I mean, yes, he's kind of under attack. It's a good shot from Novak. But, I mean, you cannot really miss that forehand there on break points. So, I mean, overall, his forehand just completely let him down in key spots. And it's really interesting to think about Federer's forehand in key situations. Because, of course, Federer's favorite shot is the attacking forehand. And yet, in key situations, and this is perhaps a topic for a different video, in key situations, I felt like it let him down so many times. Even the 2008 Wimbledon final ended with Federer missing a routine forehand. You can analyze the 2010 US Open semifinal, you'll come up with the same conclusion. The 2012 ATP finals with Djokovic, which again had a 40-15 situation and was caused by Federer's forehand. So it's really interesting how in some of these key situations, Federer's forehand actually let him down. Guys, I think it's time. Yes, I really do. I think it's time we switch to our favorite topic of all time, Rafael Nadal and his injuries. Because yes, obviously, there are some tennis players who are more fortunate with their injuries. There are some tennis players who are less fortunate with their injuries. And to be perfectly fair, Rafael Nadal does fall in the latter category. But I think it's partially his fault. The tennis goat race is essentially an endurance race. And Rafael Nadal is failing it right here, right now. Because he put all of his eggs into one basket. Which is to practice and play ridiculously hard on the worst possible surface for your overall health. And do it until your body fails you and make no adjustments whatsoever. Like, uh, it's not a surprise he's injured all the time. Because he practices ridiculously hard he plays the same grinding style of tennis all the time on the slowest surface on the planet he's not as tactical when it comes to his nutrition when it comes to his health when it comes to his body as Novak Djokovic and he's not as deadly on the court as Roger Federer he could be I really think that Nadal is a great attacking player but he chooses to be six meters behind the baseline and play top spins on your backhand so I think he really should have made an adjustment. He really should have started playing shorter points. And it's not like he's this five foot nine guy who doesn't have a good serve or cannot have a good serve. Therefore, he must play long points like Diego Schwartzman. He is the same height as Roger Federer, who has one of the greatest serves of all time. And he is arguably the greatest serve forehand player of all time. Like he could have improved his style. He could have changed. He could have made adjustments. But he refused to. To me, Rafael Nadal is like a heavyweight boxer who is great. Like, he's almost undefeated. He's like 40 and 1. But he's so afraid of losing and he has to do that long training camp, that long 12-week training camp before the fight. He cannot just go out there, you know, all figure out in the ring. He must be ready. He must be 100%. And that's why he fails because boxers are not 100% going into fights. And Rafael Nadal is not 100% going into a tennis tournament. And then he complains or then his fans complain, whatever. But he should have made adjustments when it comes to his overall nutrition, health, way of play, practicing, and so on. So, we made it to Roger. And listen guys, warning, if you happen to be by some accident a Roger Federer fan, please, for the love of God, I'm begging you, please do not, pretty please, do not compare 2011 to 2020 Federer to 2008 to 2017 Andy Murray by some accident, nine years each. And do not play with the numbers, do not compare 2011 to 2016 Federer Murray, because the results, the results will be bad for you. The results will be bad for your health. Your perception of the big three will change. Because look, 
2011, post-2011 Federer is four slams, five other finals, 25 weeks at number one, 11 Masters titles, one ATP final, zero gold medals. I had to include that, okay. To Andy Murray, 2008-2017 is three slams, eight more finals, 41 weeks at number one, 14 Masters titles, one ATP final, two golds. Yeah. Okay, so we talk about this big three all the time, and then like, ah, oh, is, is Murray really a part of the big three, right? Well, post-2011, it's a big two with Novak being here, Nadal being here, and then the other good two with Federer. I, it's, I'm, I'm just saying so many hot takes that my microphone cannot take it. With Federer and Murray being here. Like, there is a ginormous gap between this and this. The slams, the weeks, the everything is just... It's just really bad for Roger Federer. So please, guys, do not do not compare these two players. And we made it back to Novak. Now, what is hot take number two for Novak? Listen, Novak for Serbia? Not good. Not good at all. Novak playing for Serbia, Mr. Clutch, Mr. Houdini, saving match points, all of that. Gone. I mean, non-existent. Actually, the reverse of it. Like he's not, he's not horrible. Like he's not losing to randoms, but he is 0-7 in his last seven versus a top five player while playing for Serbia. Um, he loses matches in which he has match points. Really, three match points versus Yannick Sinner, and he just decides to not win that match. When does that happen? What the hell? Only four times in his career did that happen. And overall, he's like kind of messy-ish pre-2022 World Cup for Argentina. Like, he's, he's not trash, trash, but there is just something missing. Too much pressure. Does he feel different when he plays for Serbia? What's going on? Here's a stat for you. He is 16-4 and four versus Juan Martin Del Potro. He is 16-1 and one versus Juan Martin Del Potro on the ATP Tour. Who is 16-1 and one versus Juan Martin? That's, that's like... I mean, that's ridiculous. 16-1 and one versus Del Potro, you have to be the GOAT. And then he's 0-3 versus Del Po when playing for Serbia. Like, th th there is just something that's not good. Like, does he feel different pressure? I don't know. Is that a type, type of pressure that Novak just cannot digest? I don't know. He's human after all. And I don't think he's winning the gold medal. And this is... I'm, I'm, I know that some of you know Novak fans disagree. I don't think he's winning the gold medal. It's the worst possible situation. Like, he's not that good while playing for Serbia. Something's always going to happen. And then it's going to be a best of three on clay. Only the final is going to be a best of five. Post Wimbledon, after grass. And he's probably going to be torn in between where, when to focus. Do I focus on Roland Garros? Do I focus on Wimbledon? What happens in Wimbledon? Like, there is just so many factors that just... Like, like, red flag, red flag, red flag, and he's just not going to win the Olympics. I'm sorry, he's not. Like, I may be wrong, and I'm going to make a video on this, but I just don't think he's winning the Olympics. Rafael Nadal fans, listen to me. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to speak once. I'm going to articulate my thoughts once, one time only. Listen to me. I am sick. I'm sick of you. I'm sick, I'm disgusted, I'm disappointed, I'm any possible negative adjective that you can possibly think of, not because of your what-ifs, not because of your injuries, not because of the typical complaining, it's because you do not have balls, you do not have your own entity, you do not have masculinity, like what's going on, why are you a pussy? You do not understand what I'm talking about? Okay, I'm talking about the doll. Like, if you didn't get the memo so far, Fidal is 80% of the time a Federer fan who views Rafael Nadal as his little brother who's kind of good on clay and yeah, he's kind of cool, has long hair, whatever, he's a lefty, he's cool, he's cute, whatever, but Federer is going to win three out of four slams and he's going to be number one. You really let that shit slide? Really? Like, like you, you're going to do that? You're going to slide with that instead of Novak? Like, you're still going to be number two to Novak? But at least it's tennis. At least you have some arguments. Like, I don't know, you have higher peaks. You have 
Olympic golds, you have, I don't know, you're better on clay and so on, you won some important matches, actually, it's tennis, actually, you have some arguments, but you slide with Federer, and you're never going to be better at Rolexes, or have a better personality, more impactful for tennis, cooler, or whatever, when when fans talk about impact on tennis, they think about Federer, and they think about Nadal, right here, and you choose to go with that, you choose to roll with that, and the worst thing about this, so this, this is why I'm disgusted, the worst thing about this, this would be okay if you would be like below Federer by a significant margin. But that's not true. You have more. You have more Grand Slams than Roger Federer. You have 22. He has 20. You have a better head-to-head, 24 and 16. At some point, it was 23 to 10. You were winning 70% of the matches. You were ahead on hard court head-to-head. You're a clay merchant, and yet somehow you're better than, what, the second greatest hardcore tennis player of all time, Roger Federer, 9-6 to six, head-to-head at some point, and you just, no, no. I want to be his little brother. I want to talk about impact and style and persona and hairline and all that. Well, it makes sense that you're balding. You're just like being submissive to somebody who's not as good as you. Like, how does that make sense? Do you need a five foot nine white dude with like, I can't even grow a beard with a ponytail to tell you that you're being a cock. You're, you're, you're being submissive to a guy who's like not dominant. Like, what the hell are you doing? Like, grow a pair and stop talking about Vidal. Join us. Join the Novak Djokovic fan group, and we can talk about some real tennis. I did talk about the impact. So let's talk about Mr. Tennis Impact himself. Pretty person privilege Roger Federer. Because he is a good looking dude and he has privileges because of that. And I came up with this actually when I rewatched a clip from the 2009 US Open final. Of course, it's Juan Martin Del Potro, as you know, versus Roger Federer. 2009, Roger Federer is on a, what, 41 match winning streak going for number six at US Open. Ridiculous, you know, peak of his, peak of his anything. He just won the French Open. He won the Wimbledon again. He's number one again. He's great. And it's the third set. It's one to one, four four in games. And Del Potro misses a forehand. It's kind of close. It's kind of wide. He's looking. He's looking at the ref. He's looking at the mark, at the line, looking at his box, I guess. And he decides to challenge it after a decent, you know, like I don't know, six seven seconds. And the ball did end up going wide. Federer did win the game. And it's an exchange. Federer is sitting next to the ref. And he just starts dropping F-bombs. Like, don't you fucking tell me what to do. Shut up. And the ball was fucking wide. It was 10 fucking seconds. And it's like, this dude, I mean, it's a Mr. Sportsmanship Award. I don't know how many times just like destroying this ref. I mean, giving him the business. I mean, just dropping him. I mean, F-bombs left and right for a solid minute. And the funny thing is that the comments, the, the comments are always funny. 90% of the comments are like, oh, what a boss. What a Chad. He's such a Chad. He just, you know, he put the ref in his place. He told him what to do. He showed him who's the boss. Well, he's not the boss. I mean, the ref is the boss. The tournament director is the boss. Roger Federer is just a player. He has privileges because he's really good and he's a good looking dude. Imagine like 2016 Djokovic arguing with the ref. Don't you fucking tell me what to do. Shut the fuck up. Like, what do you mean? It, it kind of does get crazy with Roger Federer. He can really do whatever he wants to do. I mean, he smashes the racket. It's the most elegant racket smash of all time. Like, nobody's going to give him the typical, oh, Rafael Nadal never smashed the racket. He's such a good example. It's like, shut the fuck up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like nobody's going to tell him that. And he has those privileges because he's a good looking dude. Um, he can hit the ball kid. I think it was at Mon- Monaco 2012 and nothing will happen. Other players would get disqualified. Like Andre Rublev, in my opinion, got disqualified for way less than Roger Federer said at the 2009 US Open final to that rep. But hey, Roger Federer is a good looking dude and good looking dudes get away with a lot of things in their lives. And as I promise you, I'm going to give you a quick bonus round. Now, first of all, Djokovic. Listen, man, if you're watching this video, I love you, man, but but sometimes you're just so annoying. Like, just serve, please. Just serve. Like, just try to do what Medvedev does. The crowd is yelling. The crowd is whatever. Just serve. It is what it is. Like, the crowd, the crowd won't shut up. You cannot be focused on that one person yelling all the time. You cannot be focused on that couple of drunk dudes being annoying all the time. Just play tennis. Just play tennis. 
it's just it's just so annoying to watch it, it it gives me some like i don't know tension it it throws everything out of rhythm it's just weird to just serve the crowd will shut up if it if it doesn't it doesn't like fuck it like you make him shut up it is what it is like they don't like you just play rafael nadal listen i think you're better than you're actually showing yourself uh, this is kind of related to the second adult thing. I just don't like his PR. I, it's just he, it's just so fake. Like he's trying to be this humble dude who apparently doesn't care about records, but then he sacrifices his body, his health for the records for tennis. He's pushing this like I don't know these weird agendas of never doing anything bad, and then he's grabbing his ass in front of fifteen thousand people before every single point. Like he's doing that weird shit with his bottles and all that. So it's like I don't know. I think this should just come out and say, "Look, man, I care. I care about the records. I want to win the Roland Garros because I think that honestly, he cares the most about the records." Better listen. Talk about weak eras. And I started the video with a weak era. Like, there were some weak years, like 2022. But 2017 was also really weak. But peak Federer, I mean, it's talking about a weak era. Dude, your best opponent is Andy Roddick, who's not as good as Daniil Medvedev. Then you have David Nobandian, who's out of shape and not motiv motivated. You have a couple of dudes who hit good forehands, but that's pretty much it. Like, you have a balding Andre Agassi who's semi-retired. He retired in, what, 2006. You only have Nadal, and he's constantly beating you on clay, and he's actually beating you on hard course, too. Like, he's 9-6, and six, as I mentioned in this video. He was at 1.9-6 versus Roger Federer at hard courts. The only loss, the only loss that Rafael Nadal has outside of Wimbledon on majors to Roger Federer is at the 2017 Australian Open. Like, talking about the weak era... Federer, I mean, he was disgustingly good. Like, the only match from 2005 to 2006, which he lost in straight sets. Like, he lost one match in straight sets, was to Andy Murray's Cincinnati second round, 2006. Like, this dude was like 180-something and 9, with one match lost in straight sets. But the era was, the era was really weak. Like, 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 it was a weak era. I'm sorry.